It's not just about the calculations. It's not just about the design work. It's seeing the, the impact of a water system or, or latrines or a school, seeing how that impacts the lives of people that you're only meeting for the first time. All right, welcome. Everybody, welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. Um, I'm Bob Perry, the museum's director, and we're privileged and delighted to have a team from Engineers Without Borders USA with us here tonight for our first Mill Talk of 2024. Mill Talks are what we call our Lowell Lectures, a program that is generously supported by a grant from the Lowell Institute. The Lowell Institute, a bit about them, they were founded in 1836 to provide free lectures to the people of Boston. And they've been operating continuously since then, still doing that. Um, the Institute was funded by half of the estate of John Lowell Jr. And he was the firstborn son of a guy named Francis Cabot Lowell, who with investor partners founded the Boston Manufacturing Company, which was the textile mill that was established on this site in 1813. This was the first fully integrated factory in the world. It was a cotton textile mill, the textile mill that became the model for the lion's share of those that followed throughout New England, beginning in East Chelmsford in 1822. There is no East Chel Chelmsford anymore because in 1826 it was renamed Lowell. Why did Francis Cabot Lowell decide to build this revolutionary mill here? Infrastructure. This was the closest place to where he lived and worked, which was Boston, that had adequate water power potential in the form of a dam, that which still exists today, we call it the Moody Street Dam, that had powered a small paper mill on this site in the late 1700s. The design of the mill in this era before steam power included a large water wheel in the basement that would drive the textile machinery on the floors above. The dam created a mill pond just upstream, brimming with potential energy. The Boston Manufacturing Company built a small canal just off to the side of the dam that diverted a flow of water behind the mill at the level of the top of the dam, where it was fed into the building, turning the water wheel as it fell to the level of the river below the dam, shedding its potential energy, then exiting the building and rejoining the Charles River on the other side of this wall to continue its journey to Boston Harbor. That dam, that power canal, that water wheel technology were all essential engineered infrastructure components that together with a lot of hard work jump-started the American Industrial Re Revolution, which led relentlessly to progressive improvement in the quality of life for all the communities that it reached. That's what Engineers Without Borders USA is all about, helping communities meet their infrastructure needs through sustainable engineering, helping developing communities thrive in countries around the world here tonight to present and lead a discussion on community engineering, the work itself, its impact, and how it is a powerful calling for engineers and educators are uh, Engineers Without Borders USA CEO, Dr. Boris Martin, current uh, Engineers Without Borders USA board member and past board president, Dr. Chris Lombardo. Boris believes that every engineer today can play a role in helping humanity heal and adapt to climate change and that profound impact happens when engineers embrace their own acts of generosity as a journey of personal transformation. Boris is the CEO of Engineers Without Borders USA. His personal commitment to building positive, respectful, and mutually accountable partnerships across the world mirrors the organization's long-term commitment to communities that have allowed the organization to understand the deep complexities and nuanced challenges that resilient infrastructure can address. Perhaps above all, Boris is proud to contribute to the organization's global impact projects that provide reliable access to safe water, renewable energy, nutritious food, and improved economic opportunities for thousands of underserved communities across the USA and around the world. His commitment is to make uh, Engineers Without Borders USA a leading community engineering organization and a catalyst and partner for community engineering around the world. 
Dr. Chris Lombardo is the Associate Director of Undergraduate Studies at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and lecturer in electrical engineering. His teaching focuses on electronics, engineering design, and the intersection of engineering and human-centered design with a focus on low resource settings. Chris Lombardo began volunteering with Engineers Without Borders USA in 2004 and has been an active volunteer ever since. He serves as the faculty advisor of the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences chapter of the organization, and he has held numerous leadership roles both locally and nationally, including the curriculum chair of Engineers Without Borders USA and ASCE Global Leadership Program. Faculty Leadership Committee and is a former member and past president of Engineers Without Borders USA's Board of Directors. And now to begin our formal program, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Boris Martin. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. Everyone knows that beginning, that opening. Thank you. The words of Charles Dickens re resonate still today because they capture a deep contradiction. We live at a time where we enjoy so much wealth, the wealth driven by innovation, described just this moment by Bob in the introduction. But also we've never seen this much hurt and despair in humankind all around the world. We're closer to it than we've ever been, thanks to social media in part and the proximity that it brings between us. It's really my pleasure to be here tonight and to speak with you a little bit at the Charles River Museum to talk about what we do at Engineers Without Borders USA to address this seeming contradiction and to find a way forward together. It's a perfect place for the role of engineers in society when you think of it. Um, there's marvels on display around us that have created so much wealth for so many people. Um, I personally chose engineering uh, because I believe in the potential of technology in improving everybody's life. I marvel in what we can achieve when putting a little bit of science and understanding how the world works and how materials work. Um, when you think about the amount of pressure that is contained in some of these vessels um, and that, that, power, that at the time you know, powered so many machines. Um, I'm here privileged to address you. I know you're part of the community here and there's so many people online as well. Thank you so much for your interest in Engineers Without Borders USA. Uh, we do this work as volunteers every, every day. There is thousands of volunteers across the country and knowing that people uh, around us care about this mission as well matters to us a lot. This contradiction that is so eloquently captured by Charles Dickens in the, uh, the, the opening of A Tale of Two Cities is exactly what I would like to focus on and focus my talk about uh, on tonight. Uh, and my aim is uh, to side on the, on, on the side of hope rather than despair. Hopefully at the end of my, my, my presentation you agree with me. And I'd like to structure my remarks in three moments. Um, I think they actually match, the three moments match the uh, stated purpose of the Charles River Museum. You know, I learned in reading about the museum that there was a, a few years ago, a change in, in name. Uh, it used to be the Charles Museum of uh, Industry, and it was changed to the Charles Museum of Industry and Innovation, uh, which is a very subtle change, uh, but it means a lot. It means that it's, we're looking at the past and how you know, the, the, the amazing achievements of industry uh, in this area of the US, but we're also looking at the way engineering, innovation, and technology shapes the present and therefore also shapes the future, um, which Engineers Without Borders USA is absolutely part of doing. So m the first step and the first moment is going to be about looking back, um, uh, getting a grasp together um, of the state of the world 
the world that we're inheriting from previous generations with all of the good and all of the ugly. Um, and the current challenges that face the majority of communities around the planet. The second step will be a reflection about the role of engineers in creating a better legacy for the future generations, which is the responsibility of every generation is to steward the future for the future generations. And finally, the last step is something that uh, Chris and I will do together as a conversation, diving into the world of Engineers Without Borders USA and how we believe this organization is a formidable platform and a formidable place for engineers to learn to do that work and to join us and enact their desire to make an impact in the world. And I hope that my presentation sparks an interest in you. Uh, my hidden agenda is that you join us. <laughs> so the first part relates to the past and as it shapes also what we see around the world today. Um, and and uh, my opening sentence is that we are inheriting a wounded world and we're inheriting a broken world. What do I mean by a wounded world? Boston is built on the ancestral land and territory of the Massachusetts and the Potuket people who have lived on and cared for this land and for the water for thousands of years and who continue to live here and care for this place today. Indigenous peoples have lived in this area for th several thousand years uh, native people have lived and died, celebrated, remembered, stewarded, and honored this land and water since time immemorial. Uh, you may have heard these sentences before because they are part of like an, op you know, sort of a, a formal land acknowledgement, which many institutions now do. The history of re relations with indigenous peoples is full of hurt and injustice. The more you learn about it, the more you discover. And I have a Canadian background, and you've seen in the news in the past few years some of the residential school stories that we've uh, learned that most Canadians didn't know about. Um, it's, those are the deep wounds I'm talking about um, that must be acknowledged and that we need to continue to work to, to heal together. Of course, the work, the work of Engineers Without Borders USA is also international in nature. And the other part of my background is French. So I know a little bit about colonial history. Uh, this is also part of the legacy that we inherit. Slavery and colonization has hurt so many people around the world. And for what it's, you know, the, the, the French history is very tied to the, the, the African continent. And we may think that these things are you know, way back, it's not a, not a problem anymore, but really it is so close to our, under our skin. Everyone, in the way we perceive each other, the way we either trust each other or not. And you know, you've seen in the news recently some of the upheaval in West Africa and the anti-French sentiment that is still there. Um, this is something we inherit, that we need to be careful about, that we need to be mindful of, aware of as we do our work so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And a lot of these historical processes, engineers have been instruments of you know, enabling some of these things too. You know, I've heard yesterday in a conversation the story about some of the dams that we've built in this area that have cut off fish access and you know, going back up streams and have completely cut off sources of protein and cultural heritage for entire nations in this area back in the day. I mean, you know, dams are built by engineers. So our profession is completely part of the past, and so therefore we also need to be part of the future and learning from uh, these mistakes so that we can uh, not repeat them. And I'm sharing this about the past, and you know, those are maybe blunt words, I don't know, um, not to suggest that we should ever act from a place of guilt. It's not about guilt, it's about acknowledgement, it's about truth, it's about reparation, it's about healing and reconciliation. These things happen when we can speak openly about the past. I think it's just like family therapy. You gotta talk about things first, and then you can walk together towards a better place. So we're inheriting a wounded world. We're also inheriting a broken world. In the 20 years that I have worked in international development, I've been hosted by countless communities around the world, 
They've hosted me very graciously. I've stayed with families in places like Kenya, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Zambia, Malawi, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Guatemala. I've carried water from a contaminated source back to my host family, and I got diarrhea from it. I slept under a mosquito net that was full of holes, and I got malaria from it. Um, and for three years, my partner Alana and I lived in Burkina Faso. Um, we didn't have a fridge. We didn't have a, we used a bucket for shower every morning, which was wonderful. Um, we used a latrine. The hardest thing for me was to deal with the uh, cockroaches. That was hard to adjust to. Uh, they're not the small cockroaches that you can find in the Harvard uh, dormitories. They're actually the large ones that cast their own shadows. Uh, we lived in a small town, but I made the point of staying with smallholder farmers on a regular basis. Every season, I would spend about 10 days uh, or two weeks and stay at farmers' uh, places, work alongside uh, people to really understand the, the different seasons of the year, and I did that for three years. And I'd like to tell you a story of one of those farmers, uh, a, a good friend uh, uh, now. Um, his name is Musa. Uh, in the west part of the country. So Musa, was, we connected really right away because he was exactly my age. He already had two kids. Um, and a yeah, very entrepreneurial individual. Like uh, we would, he taught me how to make, um, ba how to weave baskets. So we'd go and like cut tall grass and like weave baskets to, uh, to, for beekeeping. Putting the baskets in the trees, get the bees in, Nine months later, climb up the tree, harvest the honey from the, from the, from the baskets, which we did the entire thing together. Um, we grafted mango trees together. We plowed land, land by, you know, his land, like multiple acres of land together by, by hand as well. It, he was ripped. He was really fit. Didn't need to go to the gym. If you ever want to uh, get ripped, start growing your own sweet potatoes in a one acre piece of land and do it by hand. It really, it really was, it was really fit. Um, the first day that I spent with Musa was um, memorable for me. So he took me around the village. The first thing was like, everybody in the village needed to know that there was this foreigner that had came up, come in. So we went and visited people, served. There's a drink, it's the sap of a palm tree kind of. It's pretty liquid, but in the morning it's very sweet, and then by midday it's fermenting, it's becoming alcoholic, and by the afternoon it's dangerous to drink. Um, so, but every single house would serve some for me, obviously, and he was watching me drink it <laughs> as the day was going on, and people were offering food every time as well, obviously. So we did the entire uh, village and then got home. I asked to use the, 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 the bathroom. Um, and, or the washroom, I don't forget which one is Canadian and which one is American, but <clears throat> it's the same. And so he said, number one, number two. I was like, well, number two. So um, he gave me a, a daba, which is a, a little hand tool that is used to like garden, basically. You know, like a garden shovel type of thing. Uh, and he said, well, here's how you do it. You know, you dig a hole, you go out in the field, and then you crouch, and, and here's a bucket of water to wash, your, you know, wash yourself with afterwards, with your left hand, never with, with your right hand. Uh, and so I did. It was a memory, like, you know, memorable moment for me. And I realized at that moment that you know, Musa lives in a village where people didn't have any latrines. Everyone was doing that. It was fertilizer afterwards. So we, our, our friendship really grew over time. You know, and I visited him every season. We did the beekeeping together. We did like the, the farming together. And we would always be, you know, the, we had uh, WhatsApp was like ahead of, ahead of time in Africa compared to here. So like we, we, we had kind of text messages and things like that. Um, and he would always nag me to come and see him. You know, it was kind of a thing like, yeah, you know, when is it you're coming back? When is it you're coming back? But at some point in the middle of that journey together, I, he, I didn't hear from him anymore. One week passes, two weeks passes, three weeks, one month, two months. Um, so after three months, I decided to go and to see where, 
What was going on? Musa's daughter had died of dysentery. She was, she was born on, uh, she was, her name was Noeli. She was born on Christmas Day. Uh, and Musa was so ashamed. He was so hurt, destroyed by that, losing his daughter, that he couldn't even look me in the eyes. The reason I'm sharing you that story is because um, the number sometimes that we hear about, you know, no access to clean water, the number of families, etc., they, they kind of numb us because they're big and it's hard to grasp what they mean. Every single one of them is a devastated family that's losing a kid. There's two mil- billion people around the world that drink unsafe water. It gives them parasites, it gives them uh, and, uh, dysentery and, and, and a lot of other waterborne diseases. There's six million, 600 million kids that attend school uh, without a proper uh, latrine or like sanitation facility in the back. So it means that when they need to go, the teacher sends them to the back of the building to just go in the field, much like I did at Musa's place. The result is that there are still five million kids every year that die before the age of five. It's one every six seconds. And the hurt of every single young dad and mom, brothers and sisters, is staggering. There's 700 million people on the planet, most of them in Africa, who don't have access to electricity. And it means that they basically spend their money and um, undermine their health in, on kerosene lamps. Um, the number of people who suffer from hunger is also staggering. Um, and the situation is about to get worse. Global average temperatures across the world are rising. Some scientists have already kind of given up on the 1.5 uh, degrees target, you know, um, above pre-industrial era. Uh, and unfortunately, this has significant consequences for vulnerable communities. In 2022, Engineers Without Borders USA, with the support financially of the Arconic Foundation and thanks to the donation of many philanthropists around the country, conducted research on the community impact of climate change. And we were, the, the, the team did that because we were a bit frustrated with the top-down down rhetoric around climate change. A lot of the language is about like, oh, things are going to change in the future. We need to be ready. And it's a lot of, you know, policy folks kind of making these big statements. We wanted to understand what communities' experience was of climate change. And so we met with uh, something like, you know, we visited 55 different project sites, met with hundreds of people, and had conversations with them about their experience, their worries as well about climate change. And the results are pretty clear. Like, climate change is not something that's going to happen in the future. It's really something that is affecting people's lives today. Um, it's about the present. You know, in some parts of the world, the, the water tables are lowering, which means that some of the shallower wells don't have, access, don't have water year-round. Uh, in other parts, there is sudden and torrential rains that destroy, uh, contaminate water sources and destroy infrastructure. Um, in many, many places, the rains are also uh, unpredictable. Many of the co- communities that we work with have a, sort of a one rainy season and that's when they grow their food. The start of the rainy season is less easy to understand or to predict, and how long the rainy season is going to be uh, is also difficult to understand. And so it means that uh, people's um, crops are failing more often. They don't exactly know when to plant. It's harder to plant at the right time. Uh, There is economic impact of that. There's also cultural impact. There's a lot of young people that are simply migrating out of the rural communities. The attachment to the land is, is kind of Um, being undermined. And it also has direct consequences on the way we design projects at Engineers Without Borders USA. We have to integrate, and we have integrated all of the learning from that, the anticipation of, you know, future weather patterns into the design of the depth of a a well, for example, uh, or the strength of systems when you have piping that's actually underground and kind of uh, connecting a water source from, from a community. So the problem is getting bigger and uh, more expensive to solve. 
That's not exactly a optimistic or joyous way to start a lecture about uh, engineers without borders. Uh, and so I thought we could, you know, uh, look again around the room and, and look at what technology can achieve for us. It's all here in the space, reminding us that we also have all the tools to make a difference. It's all here. Human ingenuity is dis on display in this space. Thank goodness <laughs> that we can cling on to that a little bit. Simple t technologies can uh, you know, create dramatic results. Today, for less than $15,000, you can uh, install a, a hand pump in Africa or in South America, pretty much. Um, solar pumps can lift water up 1,000 feet. It's astounding. I still marvel at that. How does that even work? Uh, but it's possible, and um, designers, engineers are making that possible. So the technology is well established. The costs are not prohibitive. What's in the way of success then? So in my perspective, it is not just what we do that matters. It's also how we do it. And it's really, really important for every single effort that we do to result in lasting, deep change. The change that helps communities heal, that rep repairs the wounds that we talked about in the beginning, and that provides and, and that repair the world, that provides the solution that people need. And so this kind of leads me to the second part, which is, you know, what is the role and the place of engineers in a world that is wounded and broken? So if the world is wounded and broken, then engineers must be part of healing and rebuilding. And uh, healing and rebuilding means addressing underserved communities' most pressing needs today much like Engineers Without Borders USA does, and other organizations around the world, other communities that mobilize resources towards this aim, and making sure that what we do are solutions that will bring a lasting change, that will be resilient to climate change, but also that will work with the local leadership with respect and understanding of the power dynamics that exist between people for the wounds that have been created before us. That second part is as important as the technical design. So I'll tell you a little bit of uh, uh, one story that embodies that. It's a story of a project with Engineers Without Borders USA uh, that, in my view, embodies this uh, process of repairing and, and healing. It's, it takes place in Ecuador. So I met a young woman uh, called Maria in the community of Tingo Pucara in the highlands of Ecuador. So if you haven't been to Ecuador, you should put it on your bucket list. It is a beautiful country. It's got coastal land, uh, beautiful beaches. It's got tropical forest, but it also has highlands and volcanoes. Um, it's a magical place, and the culture is, is astounding. The food is amazing. Um, the highlands of Ecuador are, are drier. They're very steep terrain, kind of stereotypical, you know, Central South America type, you know, where you, you, you see the volcanoes and people with llamas and, I know I have, you know, my role at Engineers Without Borders USA is kind of the first time for me that I travel to South America. I'm connecting with these cultures now and learning about them. In Tingo Pucara, 12 years ago, the community did not have access to clean water. And the source of water they're using is 900 feet below the village, down in the valley. And every morning, girls would go from you know, their, their mother's you know, houses and go down the, the, the field, fetch water and bring it back up with yamas and you know, filling buckets, etc. And 12 years ago, the community reached out to Engineers of the Borders USA and said, like, we would like your support. We've been working with the local government. Uh, we are out of the list of priorities for resources. We really want access to clean water now. And so a team of Engineers Without Borders volunteers came together, structured around the project, met with the community, understood the, 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 who had leadership in the place and who wanted to carry this project locally to guide every single aspect of the design together. Uh, they met with people with great respect. Uh, they understood the, uh, the sort of the criteria that the community had about how to get access to clean water. And then they got to work and designed a, designed a system. They created a catchment system at the base of the, you know, where the water source was, had um, a, a very long, you know, sort of uh, pipe, main pipe going back up to the village. They had a storage, they installed a storage tank above the, the, the community, 
and then kind of like a set of um, you know pipes for distribution into into the houses. So 12 years later, I'm the new CEO of Engineers Without Borders USA. I go to Tingo Pukara um, to understand what the legacy of this work and whether the system is actually still working or not. Um, and I met with the uh, the water management community co committee, and this is where I met Maria. So. I found in all of my travels that water management communities tend to be older people. You know, kind of the, the elders in the community and they're kind of in charge. There's a few, like more, less often, I don't know if you, you would agree with that, Chris, but less often like younger folks. And so Maria is there and she's about 17 years old. Uh, there's another young guy just beside her and they're flirting the entire meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, pay attention, folks. Uh, but the two of them are flirting. Everybody else is like showing the numbers and kind of really proud to show that they are managing uh, this system. They've repaired it multiple times. Uh, they have great finances. It's all on flip charts on the wall. It's all transparent. It's right there in front of you. Um, and, they, and, they, and the system works. Uh, we asked the community, you know, what was the, the most significant change for you? And the women said, our shoes last longer. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> that's nice. At the end of the meeting, I went to Maria and I, I, I did ask her, you know, what, what is it for you? Like, wh what has changed? And she said to me, I was five years old when, you know, you first came in. And I still remember carry, like, carrying water up and down the, the, the valley, um, but it's a distant memory. I thought it was, I felt such a sense of uh, pride and victory when she said, it's a distant memory. Uh, it's a feeling that I still nurture today. But the story doesn't stop here. I mean, the, the, the community, including Maria. So Maria is a leader now in her community. She's part of the water management committee and they want to build an irrigation system. She's the driving force behind that. She has a spark, the spark of engineering that everything is possible, that if you apply yourself to it, if you get the right partnerships, you can make it happen. That spark really matters. It's part of the development process in my perspective. It's not just about what we built, it's the way people are changed through the process. So I came back to Denver and I told my team, I was so excited about this. And, uh, and I looked for you know, early photos of this project. I was like, I need to find you know, the early parts, like who were the volunteers? And I get, I find photos in our like Facebook pages of one of our chapters about this Tingo Pukara project. And I get a photo and in it, I can recognize Mary at five years old. And she's there, one of the kids like, ah. Oh. I was like, wow. And beside her is this young woman, Natalie, who's a, an American engineer from Pittsburgh, who was on that trip and today, Natalie leads an initiative to support communities around the U.S. with their access to clean water. And when I talked with Natalie, she said, absolutely, my professional choice is completely impacted by my, my, my community visit and the work that I did with in Tingo Pukara. It's a transformative journey for everyone involved. Natalie understands the role of community leadership, the role of ownership, the respect that is needed when you work across barriers of wealth and privilege, frankly, with communities that have much less than we have, whether it is in our own backyards, in the US, or around the world. She's part of a generation of engineers that will change the world for us. That's what I mean by healing, that's what I mean by rebuilding. And so that leads me to the third part, which is, okay, well, you know, tell us a little bit more about what Engineers Without Borders USA does and how. And so for that, I'm inviting Chris to join me on stage. Chris uh, is someone who has really built Engineers Without Borders USA from the start. He's like one of the first volunteers, has been on the board, is doing so much for the organization. He has way more experience and understanding of all of it still than I do after a year and a half. And so Chris, let's sit together. <laughs> nice. So, you know, I'll start by giving you a, a sense of scale and, and a tangible sense of what this organization looks like. We have 14,000 volunteers 
that you know, have signed up to give their time and their expertise to the organization. Not all of them are engineers. Some of them are, like half of them are professionals, half of them are students. We have 230 chapters across the country, professional groups, sometimes within companies, sometimes you know, at cities. Mike, who's sitting in the audience, is kind of a leader in the Boston uh, Pro chapter of EWB. We have uh, between, anywhere between 350 to 500 active projects in 26 countries in the world, um, including across the US, as I said earlier. We've completed more than 1,000 projects already. All of them are in access to clean water, sanitation facilities, footbridges, electricity, like you know, solar panels on, on public buildings, structures like you know, school buildings for improved education, and agriculture projects. Um, so Chris, tell us a little bit. First, you know, what's, what's resonated the most with you in the, uh, in the stories that I told? Thanks, Boris. Um, you know, I think as, as I look back on my journey with Engineers Without Borders, uh, and, and the work that we do. I think one of the most powerful and uh, unique aspects about Engineers Without Borders is how we hold our community partners uh, as very much equals with our own. You know, you spoke about the, the, the power dynamics of, of education or wealth or maybe being from the West. Um, but I think one of the things that's led to the successes is, is we really, really value our community input. We, we bring them in as partners as, um, to help design whatever, whether it's a water system, a sanitation system, a school, and uh, build the partnership based on the community. And I'm drawing this as a contrast that, that Engineers Without Borders is an organization where we focus on the community partnership. In contrast to there's some organizations out there that may drill wells in a number of communities or build schools in a number of communities. And they may have that, uh, that particular technology or that may particular project type very efficient, very replicable, but without the community buy-in, the community ownership, understanding how this piece of infrastructure uh, works within a specific cultural setting, many cases without that, years later, there might not be the same successes that you experienced when, when visiting uh, the community in Ecuador like you just did uh, last year. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And, and um, you know, you're, I talked about needs assessment. Can you tell us a little bit what, how that happens in a community? Like, what, what do you do to, like, you know, understand what people really want? Yeah, so the first time a, uh, an Engineers Without Borders project team visits a community, um, you know, we frequently are always greeted uh, in a very exciting manner. Um, but, but it's a lot of work uh, for our team members. There's uh, numerous community meetings with stakeholder groups. They could be community leaders, could be like a school committee or a water committee if that's the, the infrastructure that's being talked about. Many times we'll have meetings um, where maybe only the women of the community may be involved uh, with some of our project team members who, who are women. And we may do the same thing also with maybe the male community members. Because you make it different uh, sides of the story from, from different community type, uh, different personalities. Um, but you know, it's not just the community that's involved. There's uh, local governments that have, play a role in community infrastructure. Uh, there's also other local partners who uh, may be doing this type of work uh, in that area. Um, so for example, uh, I just returned from Kenya a few weeks ago. Um, we've been working with the community of Kibon for about three years. Uh, we were there for about 12 days, but we met with uh, community members several days. We met with the county government, a whole set of contractors in preparation for what construction might look like. And in this particular case, it's uh, a water supply and distribution system for a community. Um, 
And you know, without the, the engagement of the community members and the community leaders, I would personally be concerned that we would not be doing our due diligence as an organization. Because what I would love to know is after any project we complete, if we can show up there 12 years later, you know, like you did in your experience, communities continue to maintain a project. Of course, things are gonna break. They've raised the funds to do that maintenance, to repair uh, any faults with the system. And uh, as uh, the, you, know, you, you tell the story, fetching water was a distant memory. And I think that's what we hope for, for many of the communities that we work with. Nice, thanks. Um, so there's a whole aspect of volunteer engagement that also, you know, sort of is part of the project process. Can you tell me a little bit, and you work with a lot with, with students. So tell me a bit, like, what changes have you seen in kind of the, the students' engagement uh, around you? Um, and also, like, what change do you see for, like, with students once they get engaged and, like, you know, after they, what do they learn? Yeah, th you know, thanks, Boris. Um, so when I, when I started with Engineers That Borders about 20 years ago, I myself was an undergraduate student and then uh, continued in graduate school. And, you know, I'd say in my first sort of five or ten years of involvement, uh, Engineers Without Borders was a, a student or, or professional club where, hey, I can learn some professional project management skills, I can, I, I can learn my craft on, on some design work, I can do a lot of good at the same time. Um, but you know, a really interesting shift has happened in sort of the past five or ten years. Uh, more and more I see students coming to to Engineers Without Borders, and they say, I know I want to do international development work. I know I want to work with communities. And sort of this deliberateness of, of the choices that the, our volunteers are making as they're coming to, to join the organization is really this transition that I've seen occur over the relatively short life of our organization over that past 20 years. And then, you know, you touched on uh, how does the Engineers Without, Without a Borders experience? Um, it's been transformational for you, you know, it, it's been transformational for me. Um, but how have I seen that in, in some of our volunteers? And I think for most of us who, who participate in organizations like these, um, we're very excited when we get to know we're going to meet a community. We're doing design work, because of course, a bunch of us are engineers, not all of us, we're excited by design work. But that, you know, the switch really flips when you get in the community the first time, you get to know the individuals um, that you're working for. And it's not just about the calculations, it's not just about the design work, it's seeing the, the impact of a water system or, or latrines or a school seeing how that impacts the lives of people that you're only meeting for the first time. So I think what's really exciting is students come back, keep coming back. They have that first transformative experience. It's almost like they've drank in the Kool-Aid. That you know they can't they can't get enough of it, uh, my, myself included, because that was that was me in in 2005. Um, but I think the you know the the really exciting thing is for for most of our volunteers. You know I hope that they they take this experience into whatever career that they move into, and it might not be international development engineering. But one of the also very exciting things I've watched is the the number of students who the Engineers Without Borders experience has materially affected where they have chosen to go with their careers. They want to pursue careers in international development. Um, they maybe had interests in other areas of engineering, and they've decided infrastructure is critical, whether internationally or domestically. And seeing that transformation due to working with low resource communities, communities who are in many ways less fortunate than us, 
is very exciting. It gives me hope for, for this generation of students and young professionals. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, can you tell us what makes, in your view, what makes a project successful? Wow, so many things. There's so many things to make a project successful. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to come out and, and joke up front. We always need funds. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in donating, please join. But uh, no, but actually, um, so I think there's a number of things. The, the relationship that we have with our communities, that we don't do uh, a single project type that's replicated several times, I think that helps with the longevity of the projects. That's what makes them sustainable years after they're constructed. I think that uh, while we are an engineering organization and we know our roots are engineers, we actively recruit and welcome all of the, the disciplines, the professions that really make infrastructure possible public health professionals, medical professionals, people who have an understanding of economics, because you know you need to make a water system work. It's not just that, that, that our organization comes in and builds something. You need to have an economic model to raise money so that when something breaks, not if it breaks, it will break, uh, it can be repaired. And that our partner communities can't and shouldn't be reliant on, on a Western organization uh, for for perpetuity. Um, our goal, is, you know, there's an anecdote of you know teach a person to fish and they can provide for life, and and I think that resonates uh, very true with with a lot of the work that we do. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Chris. We we would love to also take a few questions from the from the audience and to open it up as a conversation. So I'll give my microphone, and then we can. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you do any coordination of any kind with Kiva loans. Because um, Madagascar's, you know, it's like all these bright people who want to find some way to do solar on Madagascar, which was a great idea. And the, the loans are the microsystem. Um, and I know that's separate from you, but it seems like it's it's right on on the edges of each other. So I just wondered if you. Yeah, well, you can keep the mic and. Yeah, so you're referring to an organization that provides you know micro loans to people so they can buy something and then make a business out of it. It's just a different approach than kind of like building basic infrastructure in communities. But there's a link, right? So in in situations where you know we're providing electricity to a uh, to a community, or there are ways that that can be monetized. You know, you can sell uh, cell phone charging services and other things. So there's a, a, a virtual cycle of the capital that we bring into the community that can be then pay forward in multiple ways. We don't provide financial capital like that. It's more like you know infrastructure capital. But th I think the uh, the mechanisms you know behind that can be similar at the end of the day. Hi, can you tell us more about the role of women in these community projects? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so I'm going to answer the question from from two different sides. Uh, I'll, I'll first talk about our project teams. So, um, you know, I feel really fortunate, at least in, in our chapter. Our chapter for an engineering school is well over 50% women. Uh, exactly, thumbs up. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but, but I really think um, it's crucial to be providing, especially water services, because in so many of the communities and cultures that we work in, it's primarily women and children who, who are responsible for, for gathering water. Uh, so I previously talked about um, in, in many projects, the project teams have women-only meetings, and so members of, of the Harvard chapter as well as other chapters do this. And, you know, I'd love to be on a fly on the wall, and I, I get the reports afterwards, but um, our team has gathered so much valuable information by creating that safe space for women in the community to talk with our women team members. Um, it, it's really highly influenced uh, some of the design choices that were made 
and that information would not have come out of a, of a water committee meeting that was uh, mixed gender. And we've done this in, uh, me personally, in the project teams I've been a part of in, in multiple countries, but I know that this is a theme throughout uh, a greater number of projects that, that I've been associated with. Is that because women are marginalized in some of these our communities? Uh, I think that in, in some cases that's absolutely true that, that women are marginalized. I think um, in, in some cultures in general the economic uh, breadwinners of households are men. That's not always true. Um, and I think there's a lot of different factors because Engineers Without Borders works in a few dozen countries and there's a lot of cul cultural differences across there. Um, in, in some places we work, uh, that, that at least I've personally worked, women have leadership roles on the water committee, but those uh, uh, marginalization is still occurring even if the, the chairperson of the water committee is a woman. So I can't speak to knowing any individual community's culture in depth. Uh, I haven't spent three years in a community like Boris has in Burkina Faso, and I'd argue that's only maybe scratching the surface on truly understanding a culture that, that's different than your own. But um, I think we're sensitive to understanding there are our gender dynamics at play, and we want to make sure that the infrastructure that we design in partnership with the communities is really gonna be utilized effectively by those who are using it. And frequently that is the women in the community. Could you tell us more about how you follow up on some of these projects? I mean, you mentioned 12 years later, but is that the first time you followed up on that community uh, or were there other times? Thank you. That, I think that's probably very important to a lot of people that are interested. Yeah, for sure, thank you. So the, the way the project process works at Engineers Without Borders USA, the way it's designed and managed uh, is first like the needs assessment, then uh, a alternative analysis, then kind of your design construction, and then there's two years of post-construction active monitoring during which the team does operations and maintenance training so that for two years, the, 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 the team makes sure that there's proper ownership and management of whatever asset has been built. And then we have a, like our national team does like long-term monitoring. So there's like spot checks around all of the projects, the thousand projects that we've done haven't been, you know, all of them systematically, you know, sort of visited after five years, but we have enough data that we can actually infer kind of like the level of the rate of survival, you know, at five years and 10 years. Um, which is about 85 percent. Yeah. And I think something that <clears throat> we're moving towards in, in the coming years is we're, we're deliberately working with a select number of on-the-ground partners um, and we're trying to cluster projects in sort of those geographic areas. So let me give you an example. Um, in Kenya, the Harvard chapter works this, with this community, Kibon. Um, the San Francisco professional chapter works with the community of Layla. The Virginia Tech chapter works with the community of Masara Steel. And we all work with the same individual. His name is Paul Longo. And so Paul works with six or eight communities in six or eight chapters. So if something goes awry in the community that I work with, uh, Kibon, he's gonna know about it. Um, if something goes awry in Layla, where he grew up, he's gonna know about it. So it's not that it has to be a year or two later um, where the individual chapter may visit the community. We have on the ground people that are much more in touch day to day of what is, you know, is there, was there a design problem? Oh, is it just a stainless steel rod that broke and that's simple maintenance and we need to contact a local technician. But we have people on the ground who are partners who um, work with multiple communities. We're trialing this in, in a few areas, but it's a model we're looking to expand to in almost everywhere that we work. 
So just a follow up. So do you have personal experience where something like that has come up, where some of your people on the ground have come back and said, hey, they need a little bit more help. Can you go back and help them? Yeah, certainly. Um, some of the work I've done in both Mexico and the Dominican Republic, you know, things break, routine maintenance issues. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to, to be in contact with our community partners to know, okay, this particular part or this particular system has a maintenance issue so our team can look back and say, was it a design flaw or was it a simple maintenance issue? Um, moving forward in, in uh, Western Kenya and Megori County where I was speaking of, this individual, Paul, he's not only working with the, uh, the six or eight communities I've mentioned, he is also working with the county government, he works with contractors, so he's really becoming an uh, epicenter for, for the communities in Megori County to not only the engineers that borders partners with, but other communities and hopefully maybe other entities in the future. Does he also play a role in selecting new projects and that sort of thing as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he's, his reputation has, has gathered. So uh, even from my personal experience when we were uh, in the community uh, last May, um, in the process of drilling a well in the community, a, uh, a new community, and, a, and the name escapes me at the moment, but their water committee came out to witness the drilling. Um, Paul introduced them to myself and to our project team. And while the drilling was occurring, you know, a few tens of feet away, um, myself, one of our other mentors, were talking with that water committee about what the, the Engineers Board Without Borders process looks like, um, what a timeline might look like for projects, what those relationships look like. And uh, since then, since you know, summer 2023, uh, that community has submitted an application to Engineers Without Borders USA. That uh, project's been approved, and we're waiting for a chapter to adopt the project to work with that community. Thank you. Back to the operation. Look, are you going to be continuing involved in the project? Like, there is no, after you commission the project, does the local people going to be taking care of it? Or how does the whole thing happen? Or who, I mean, is, who's responsible for tra training and day-to-day -day maintenance of equipment and, you know, make sure that the whole operation is smooth and uh, is, is running properly? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So part of every um, design and construction phase is making sure the community has the knowledge to do the operation and maintenance of whatever system it is, whether it's a water pump, a latrine system, a solar energy system. So in some cases, uh, our project teams will directly work with community members or a small set of, say, technicians, people who would be trained to be like the system operators or, or system maintenance people. In other cases, our uh, contractors who um, maybe of the culture or the communities where we work, they're more uh, culturally appropriate to, to do that or maybe have a better grasp of whatever local language it is. So in some cases, they're the ones who do those trainings. Um, but ultimately, the goal is that uh, communities are not reliant on engineers without borders uh, moving forward. So we really focus on the skill building within the communities to do simple operation and maintenance. Sure, of course, there might be a larger um, failure of some kind. People like Paul or other uh, in-country groups can know where to get technicians or uh, find parts suppliers or contractors in the area. So we're certainly around for a subsequent few years post-construction, but we don't want the community to be reliant on us in, in perpetuity. Another question I have, look, how is the local government or ordinance like, you know, approach you guys because this is a non-governmental, you know, activity or project. And particularly if you're in a remote area or in various countries, because I have been to some of these places mm -hmm. and governments uh, sometimes are not very friendly with those projects because 
they have a fear of, uh, you know, influencing this NGO in that community. I'm just wondering, you know, what is your experience? Yeah. Um, well, you're touching on multiple things. One, every time there's a project, the, the project team engages with the municipality. Most of the time, in fact, the municipality provides some of the funding for the project. The community raises some of the money, the municipality does as well, and then the project team raises the rest. So they're involved in it. And the politics of you know, where the resources go and whether there's always some kind of, uh, what we sometimes witness is, you know, a mayor was in, you know, a mayor was elected by a certain, you know, part of his district, and uh, he favors the people that voted for him uh, and provides funding there and not elsewhere. So we have to, whenever we do strike, you know, partnerships with local municipalities, we have to be very clear with them that we're not, we're not discriminating based on political color, uh, and that's part of the rule of engagement. Uh, but those are some of the more complex kind of like partnership management principles that we've had to learn over the years. Uh, it's not just building something, it's really embracing the entire complexity. You know, you talk about, you know, you ask pointed questions about operations and maintenance and who owns this asset at the end of the day. In the early days of Engineers Law Borders USA, there are some mistakes that were made like that, um, where it wasn't clear who was owning the asset. And if you've built a bridge, and the local, you know, the Ministry of Infrastructure did not want a bridge there, and it does not want to be responsible for maintaining it, then that becomes a danger for everyone involved. Because what, what after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, the bridge needs maintenance, and if it doesn't have it, and if it fails. So we've had to like evolve the approach to really make sure that the national government, regional government, district governments understand what's being done and where and have a say and have, you know, sort of sovereignty over their own uh, infrastructure. Much like, you know, you wouldn't want someone coming into the U.S. and start building stuff in the middle of Boston. I mean, you know, so same thing everywhere in the world. Thank you. <laughs> um, so you were, you are talking about training. Is that mostly like uh, in-person demonstration and word of mouth, or do you provide a repository of documentation with parts lists and assembly <laughs> guides and, and troubleshooting and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and in uh, the simple answer is I'm gonna say all of the above, uh, but the, so uh, in preparation for any, any construction project, the, the project teams, in addition to producing uh, design documentation, engineering analysis, and so forth, is also required to put together a uh, operations and maintenance manual for the community, for whatever the built system is. And that should include things like data sheets for um, let, you know, a pump that you might buy in the community, or a solar panel, or, or things of that sort. Um, a, uh, a regular schedule of maintenance tasks, you know, whether it's a weekly or a monthly or a yearly type task based on uh, whatever built system it is. Um, and and as I, those, those manuals are provided to the community in their own local language. So if it's not English, which many of the places we work, uh, it is not English, then our teams find either members within their own project teams who have language skills. So for example, it's not all that difficult to find somebody who uh, has Spanish language skills and can do pretty good translation there. Um, or for some of the less commonly spoken languages, at least in the US, that sometimes will rely on our international partners who are frequently fluent in English, but also whichever local language uh, that's spoken. Many times they can help us with those translations as well. Do you work with the United Nations too? I believe that we've had partnerships um, with different branches of the UN, provided funding for some of the work. And you know, maybe linked to the question you're asking is, there's a lot of institutional funding you know, that goes towards infrastructure for development. Um, and so what's the role of philanthropic you know, activities like the work of Engineers Without Borders in that? And uh, one of the, you know, when, when Chris was describing 
the, uh, the role of local partners that we work with in really guiding the work, selecting projects, building a track record and building a reputation for themselves as community engineering providers in those countries. What, what we've learned over the past decade in working with these partners in that, is that they have their own vision and their own strategy and their own ambition for impact in their own communities. And so we can work with them build a track record that is necessary to, to demonstrate the capacity and the, the, the frankly, the, the appropriateness of the work we do with them and alongside them. But then once we have a track record, we can build on that and access more significant amounts of funding to actually do these things at scale. And so the way I present this, this the, the efforts of Engineers Without Borders USA in a way is to catalyze change, to build a generation of organizations around the world that are focused on addressing the needs of underserved communities, which otherwise don't get served. Because there's a reason why, after so many decades of effort in you know, providing infrastructure, in most countries, there's still, including across the US, there's still communities that just are underserved. Um, and so there is a generation of organizations and organizational leaders that want to apply engineering at a community level to really spark change from the bottom up and we're there to support these organizations. And we're one of them as well, because we do work in our own backyard. So it's much more of like an equitable partnership and allyship amount, uh, among organizations doing this work than it is us doing it for everybody else. Can you discuss the projects that are in the United States? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Well, this is a great question. So um, there's many communities around the US that uh, we're really you know, wealthy and, and, uh, and thriving towns a, a while back. Uh, and over you know, change in economy, change in, in circumstances have become you know, underserved and, and under-resourced, sometimes kind of ghost towns. You know? um, I've been in places in Pennsylvania with like you know, 50 or 100 houses in, in a small community that has no police service, uh, no fire station, no post office, and only a part-time person who's basically there to coordinate the city, like the, the town services. Um, they oftentimes don't have, and they may have a system for water that is autonomous, that serves the 50 houses, but that's not plugged to a municipal system. Um, when these systems age, uh, and they break, so then suddenly, you know, someone's gonna turn on the water and it's gonna come rusty brown. Uh, there's something's wrong with my water, what's going on? Okay, everyone, you know, around the town is, you know, getting together. What do we need to do about this? They call the, they call the municipality and the municipality says, okay, well, uh, it's $2 million to get connected, to get your system to a standard where you can get connected to the, to the, the, the public, you know, service. They don't have that kind of money because oftentimes it's, you know, uh, average income of $30,000 a year or something like that. And so um, they, but there is funding for them available. There's state revolving funds, there's federal funding. The bipartisan infrastructure bill is also bringing a significant amount of resources across the country for these communities. The question is, how do they access it? Because it's still very difficult to make your case. And so they call upon Engineers Without Borders USA volunteers across the country to provide the pre-engineering reports needed, which is a technical report, which you can hire for twenty, thirty thousand dollars maybe. So it's still a significant amount of work and engineering done to assess the need. They don't have that kind of, and, and it's a risk, right? Like, because you're not sure that you're gonna succeed in your grant application. So are you gonna spend 30,000, if you make $30,000 a year, are you gonna spend that much money, a year's worth of income, on a report that you're not sure is gonna give you a positive answer. So we basically de-risk that process. We do it pro bono. We have amazing professional engineers across the country that are willing on their way back from work or on their way to work to stop in a community that otherwise they would never go to, to meet people they would otherwise never meet, to form a relationship, to get to know people, to understand their needs, and then the team provides the pre-engineering services needed to then make a case. And then we've had communities then go to their state, you know, revolving funds, go to the federal government, and access millions of dollars to do upgrades that otherwise 
they would never had they would never have would have applied to even get that funding and so in the case of the US projects we're not there to replace the private sector that's very capable of doing design and build you know once the project is won but we support communities to get to the place where they can actually access those funds and you'd be surprised how many communities just don't have even it's really hard to get an engineer these days you know just like tradespeople this is very difficult you can and so some communities never get their phone calls answered because they're just, you know, it's almost like they're not worth it. So what, the thousand projects you're talking about, how many So the domestic program is a little bit more recent. It's growing. Today, the, um, there's about, you know, in our, in our current database of active projects, there is 50 of them in the U.S., and you know maybe 320 of them across the world. It's growing though, because we are a uh, you know there's a, a technical assistance centers across the country that have been set up by the Environmental Protection Agency, and Engineers Labos USA is the sole engineering partner to six of those uh, regional technical assistance centers. So this is something that the the demand is uh, going to increase significantly in the coming years. How might someone get involved in Engineers Without Borders, um, either as a student or as someone in industry? That's a great question. So um, throughout <clears throat> almost every city and state in, in the US, um, you know, if you're a university student, many, not all, but many uh, universities have Engineers Without Borders chapters. Um, there are also local professional chapters throughout the nation. Uh, basically, you just need to email somebody, say, hey, I'm interested, and show up at a meeting. Um, and, and, and I do want to reinforce, though, if you happen to be a university student, let's say your university does not have an Engineers Without Borders chapter, one, you could focus on starting one, but two, you can also participate with either other university chapters or other professional chapters. Similar professional member, and you know you don't have a huge density of professionals around you, but there's universities there. All of the student chapters uh, need professional mentors. So professionals can work with student chapters as well. So really, uh, a location title or a university name is, is only that. That's just a physical location. Um, but most, most chapters out there are always interested and excited to have, have new members, people who are enthusiastic about the cause. With native communities, how I, that can be complicated, and I just wondered how that works. Yeah, I mean, indigenous, indigenous communities um, um, have their own leadership structures and have their own you know, sort of governance, and uh, there's a whole process for them to make decisions about what they want to do and how, uh, and it's just a matter of respecting that process, understanding it, under understanding who to speak with, and being there with the community all along, because um, you can't take, you can't cut corners. I think, uh, and we have practitioners in the room who have tremendous experience uh, doing this work, uh, who will also guide the, the work of engineers and voters in that space. Thank you for your discussion so far. Uh, so my question is, when it comes to uh, design, de design decisions, uh, when the community needs don't align with what the community wants, how are those decisions made? Like the really tough, difficult ones. <laughs> well, thank you, Boris. I'd be happy to answer the question. <laughs> So, so that's, you know, a, a really difficult challenge. Um, I think some of the, the real learning that, that's happened over the early years of Engineers Without Borders is our teams, like, like some others, would listen to what, what community members or community leaders would say, respond, design, build, oh wait, classic engineering problem. That wasn't actually the problem. The problem was actually something else. Um, 
And so I think that's, that's a difficult discussion and I don't think there's a, a, a slam dunk right answer. Um, one of the many common themes uh, in, in many of our communities where uh, clean potable water is an issue is uh, sanitation is also a problem. Um, we've seen throughout the news, lots of international organizations have lots of clean water campaigns. Uh, it's been said that water is sexy. Uh, sanitation, not so much. We don't really like talking about uh, latrines and human excrement and where that needs to go, but it's an extremely important problem, almost a more important problem than clean water in the sense that without... Many times it is the cause for, uh, of unclean water. So having the cultural sensitivity to have discussions about here is a stated problem that, that community members or community leaders have identified and teams on the ground with the, the professional experience they bring may say, yes, this is an issue, but there's a different root cause. There's no slam dunk. It's a hard problem, um, but our teams have to work through it, and I don't have a perfect answer for you. <laughs> yes, so your question is? Okay. <laughs> but, but, I, but I will say to your point, um, so for those of you who, who didn't hear the statement, the statement was for every gallon of water delivered, there's a gallon of water you have to dispose of. Um, and so I think on the sanitation angle, that's an absolutely uh, critical thing. I think one thing that our teams have learned over the years that is very related to that statement is areas who typically have not had a lot of water um, have water services provided. Uh, our teams need to be really careful about water is a great breeding ground for mosquitoes and mosquito-borne illness. So uh, our teams do think a lot about, wait, if there's this great water resource that, that our communities have water security, they have potable water, but that also can cause other knock-on effects. So, um, our teams are very sensitive to that and do consider that, uh, and at least I know our team considers that almost all the time when there's a large amount of water storage or where wastewater, not even necessarily uh, sanitation or latrines, but where does wastewater go so it doesn't pool and be a breeding ground for mosquitoes or other insects. I have a question, uh, has the uh, U.S. and worldwide enrollment in engineering schools grown, stay flat, or decrease? Um, in um, 20 years ago, uh, the concentration of engineers, you know, in the U.S., in in Europe, in kind of like wealthy uh, countries, is very high, and it was almost absent in, uh, especially in Africa. Today it's different. There's a lot of universities in Nairobi, in Kampala, in, in Accra. There's tremendous, uh, very high quality engineering schools. So we are seeing a greater number of engineers going out into these markets. But I think the ratio is still that on a per capita basis, uh, there's 900 times more engineers in the US than in Uganda. So there is still a significant deficit of that kind of resource uh, in developing countries. So that's something that, you know, the work of Engineers Without Borders USA is addressing a gap in that, in that way. And we also work with, you know, local, uh, local universities and always look for building talent locally as part of our work, because ultimately that's the long-term the long-term answer. The other part of that, you know, is we're, we're part of a global network of engineers without borders organizations. There's about 70 of them around the world. I used to work in the Canadian organization and there's also some in the global south, in South America, in, in Africa, in Asia. Uh, so it's a phenomenal network of organizations, each of them driven to address needs in their own country and also internationally for those who can afford it. 
I, I think one problem is lawyer, engineers don't get the respect that they used to get. They also don't get the salaries the lawyers get. Absolutely. <laughs> to, to add on to, to your point, something that a number of our project teams uh, do in alignment is they do try to form partnerships with local universities. Uh, the chapter I work with works with the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I know uh, a New York chapter has worked with universities in Rwanda, et cetera. And, and you know, that, that that hits on another angle on our mission, which is developing the human talent. So we've really talked about the, the community infrastructure for most of our conversation this evening, but, it, but another angle is developing the, the human talent and the leadership with our partners. And we found that uh, by working with the University of Nairobi, engineering school that there's, as Bo was saying, very talented engineering students uh, as part of those institutions who uh, are itching to get project experience uh, because the hands-on engineering experience is less prevalent uh, as part of education in, in a number of the countries where we work. Um, but the students have great technical skills and provide a cultural perspective that uh, our project team members frequently don't. They're, they're almost a, a translator or mediator, and not only in language, but in, in culture as well. Look, uh, folks, it's time for me to say thank you, thank you. For, to all of you for your interest in Engineers Labors USA. You know, ultimately the work that we do is possible when we share the story, when we share our passion. I hope that's what we did tonight. Um, we invite you to consider joining the organization in one way or another, um, because the more uh, we are with this mission, the, more, the further we can go uh, together. So thank you very much again for coming tonight.